Tarfia joined the University of Michigan faculty this fall as the Nicholas Del Banco Visiting Professor of Creative Writing and Poetry. She's a published and prize-winning author, as you know from the information we sent out. Today, she's going to be reading from her first book, Seam, which was published uh, earlier this year and which has already garnered its first award, a Crab Orchard Series First Book Award, as well as reading from her um, upcoming collection titled Register of Eliminated Villages. We've asked Tarfia to speak for a host of reasons, one, because she's obviously an eminent poet, but also because her work engages very particularly with, um, I know she has a personal engagement with the tragedy of the Pakistan Civil War of 1971, or the War of Liberation, as it's known in Bangladesh. And clearly, her work um, engages that issue and also the broader theoretical issues that are um, that that are germane to that event, including violence, violence against women specifically, memory, and as she mentioned to us about this talk, the role that poetry itself can play in uh, our processing these uh, tragic events of the past. Anyway, without further ado, please welcome Tarfia Faizola. Thank you so much, Farina. Um, it's so lovely to be here with you all today. Um, I want to actually start by talking a little bit about collaboration and um, sharing with you all a project I worked on um, last spring. Seam actually um, arose from um, some poems. It started out as poems I started writing in graduate school, um, imagining conversations between um, some version of me, I suppose, and um, these Bangladeshi women who were raped by um, Pakistani soldiers in the 1971 war. And I hit kind of an ethical wall um, at some point writing the poems purely for my imagination. Um, I, I felt like I needed to be in Bangladesh um, to sort of experience the landscape of where all of that had occurred, um, as well as I wanted to see if there was an opportunity to try to speak um, with the women themselves. Um, who are um, in their 50s and 60s um, by now. And um, <clears throat> so I went to Bangladesh, and Seam arose from work I had done before, as well as poetry um, I wrote while I was there. And while I was there, um, I had an opportunity to meet um, a lovely couple, Robin Sukadia, who is an um, amazing tabla player. Um, and he was, um, um, he was on a Fulbright as well in um, Calcutta doing um, uh, studying the effects of music education on street children in Kolkata and Ahmedabad, India. So um, I met him, and through him I met his wife, um, Nilanjana Banerjee, who um, is a community organizer as well as um, an editor. She works for Kaya Press, which is um, a really wonderful and distinct press that um, publishes a lot of Asian American literature. So. At some point, um, Neela invited me to um, participate in a show at USC that um, paired together um, uh, musicians um, with poets to see if there was a conversation that could happen and a possible collaboration. So through that, I met um, Nabeen Shanti, who is a MC and producer um, based out of New York. Um, what's interesting about the four of us is that we all sort of grew up um, in, I grew up in Texas, Neela grew up in the Midwest, in Ohio, um, Robin um, grew up in North Carolina, and Nabeen grew up in um, Northern Virginia. So we kind of represented a lot of different regions as well. Um, and so we ended up doing this collaboration that included um, Nabeen making music and us putting that together, along with Dubla playing from Robin, and um, we added a video component as well. So I wanted to share that with y'all at first because I feel like it speaks to a, some of my current concerns, concerns as an artist, which are sort of like, how do we move the conversation past our distinct genres? Because I feel like these vocabularies are um, simultaneously um, similar and different. There's a lot to be learned there. So um, I'm going to start with that. And if I could get the lights dimmed just a little bit, that'd be great.
sorry, I totally pulled up the wrong file. <laughs> I was like, at some point I start talking, right? And then I was like, no, apparently I don't start talking at some point. I'm sorry, hold on one second. All right, sorry about that, one more time. Feast or famine. When the night gapes wider, the child you once were wakes and chokes with hunger, and you begin to soothe her as you always do, first with hunger and then more hunger, because it's summer, because the days are longer, because you have to keep her lean, because yes, she has to learn to want, because yes, she has to train to run through spring, its melting forest of primitive stars, to follow the path of water, far from your parents, far from the scars left by the man who pinned you to yourself when he stubbed lit cigarette after lit cigarette after lit cigarette on your thighs. When the night bloats open, you tell the little girl you still are and once were to go back to sleep, to curl inside the rise and fall of your lover asleep beside you. This man who loves her and you, that she doesn't have to steal the past anymore. That in Bangla, Kida Lage can mean I feel hunger as well as I want you. That the milk fat swell of the belly of sorrow's gluttony will only disappear when she starves you. Kida Lage, you whisper to the man who strokes her hair and devours your mouth, and the ghosts whittle into whispers flayed of their lost appetites. Listen, even now, they gather in the narrow larynxes of cruel men, mouths open, ready to feast. Nocturne in need of a bitch. Forget the sounds of glass shattering, the alleyways I walk past, hunger knifing me cleaner. Forget the schizophrenic I still see, years now. Forget his voice burning past me. Bitch, I need you. Bitch, I need, I need, he moans. And though it's not me he wants, the night is a varnished peeling wall against which I always want to be roughly pressed. How many other nights has he stumbled across the sidewalk, pleading with someone else who isn't there? Cars blast by, earthquake of bass, crackle of voices, thigh, throat, 
clavicle, crook of elbow, curve of breast, bitch, I need, I need. And there's no forgetting those summers all of us spent sleeping underground in that old peach carpeted basement. No forgetting how my sister was still safe and warm beside me the night I heard footsteps that weren't ours or our parents. I took her smaller hand in mine, waited until dawn when the footsteps finally ceased. Dream summoned, alive or ghostly, I'll never know. But what does that have to do with lips, tug of earlobe, palms macerating palms? I need, I need, and the hunger inside me isn't for food, and I can't forget we don't belong anywhere. Not the city, not in childhood's bed, or the adult one I slide alone into after praising your name, Lord. Tell me why being human is so fucking lonely, why this man turns now to embrace no one beside him. Tell me why my sister is a ghost stepping lightly across the floors of strangers, their children asleep below. Tell me why, Lord, you made it so that taking a kiss full on the mouth feels like weeping, the helpless swell, this delicious spill. I need, I need, take then as you took her too. Take the morning sandpaper sunlight in which I'll wake again to offer you another day of hunger. Take from me this razor humming inside my body you made for any kind of breaking. Love poem ending with the eye of a needle. Sure, I know I summoned you away from me, but don't you know I'm heavy with your leaving? A single branch swaying from another finch alighting? Every night, my spine dreams a child into a scythe that tames my torso so it won't unravel towards you. But please, Prem, tell me again that water is a pattern interrupted by my unbuttoned body. Even if I don't tell you the shape I make arching beneath the drape of his panting, a taut ripping so natural, I wonder if there's a placket in me large enough to pocket the thought of you. I wanted to pleat your fingers slight bending when they hovered over my knee. You parked the car, reached toward me to flick another suicide bombing off the radio. It fucks with me, the binding of love between two people who have never touched and never will, the severed distance between us this far apart, width of the widest river or narrowest blade of grass, length of the strand of thread. My mother taught me to first bite free with your teeth, then wet with your tongue to struggle through the thin eye of any needle. She says, your English is great. How long have you been in our country? And I say, suck on a mango, bitch, since that's all you think I eat anyway. Mangoes are what model minorities like me know nothing about, right? Doesn't a mango just win spelling bees and kiss white boys? 
Isn't a mango a placeholder in a poem folded with saris? But this one, the one I'm going to shove down her throat, is a mango that remembers jungles jagged with insects, the river's darker thirst. This mango was cut down by a scythe that beheaded soldiers, a mango that taunts and suns itself into a hard palmed fist only a few months a year, fattens while blood stains green ponds. Why use a mango to beat her to death? Why not a coconut? Because this exotic fruit won't be cracked open to reveal its own whiteness to you. This mango is an alien merely because of a bone-hard brown shell. It knows it's worth waiting for. It wants to be needed for ripeness. Mango. My own sunset-skinned heart waiting to be held and peeled. Mango, my mother taught me to cut open with my teeth. Darfia, she would say. This is how you eat a mango. So there's that. Um, one of the reasons um, I wanted to show this too, I think, is because um, it speaks to something that um, I'm really fascinated by, which is kind of how um, to to use sort of like what's happening digitally out there to create new artistic possibilities. So all of the videos um, that we did were sort of used with um, Creative Commons. Um, the most exciting thing about that to me was um, the um, video for a love poem ending with the eye of a needle that um, made use of um, this really beautiful a movie called Sita Sings the Blues that um, was made available through Creative Commons because she got so tired, the filmmaker Nina Paley got so tired of sort of dealing with how to navigate distribution and um, corporate endorsement. And so um, she made it available and she says very plainly on her website um, to, you know, that there's, that you can remix, redistribute it as you see fit. And I think there's something really profoundly beautiful about that, um, you know, particularly um, as it, you know, like is a movie that depicts um, scenes from the Ramayana. Um, so I like this kind of like, this combination of modernity and ancient um, sort of thinking or ancient art that's sort of happening as well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna read um, a little bit from Seam. Um, I'm going to start with the first poem of the book, 1971. <clears throat> um, and there's a little brief epigraph sort of describing um, the historical context of um, the book. 1971. On March 26, 1971, West Pakistan launched a military operation in East Pakistan against Bengali civil civilians, students, intelligentsia, and armed personnel who were demanding separation of the East from the West. The war resulted in the secession of East Pakistan, which became the independent nation of Bangladesh. According to Bangladeshi sources, 200,000 women were raped and over 3 million people were killed. 1971. One. In West Texas, oil froths luxurious from hard ground, while across Bangladesh, bayoneted women stain pond water blossom. Your mother, age eight, follows your grandmother down worn stone steps to the old pond, waits breathless for her to finish untwining from herself the simple cotton sari to wade alone into green water. The same color, your mother thinks, as a dress she'd like to twirl the world in. She knows the strange men joining them daily for meals mean her no harm. 
they look like her brothers do. Nights they jump back over the iron gate, drenched in the sense of elsewhere, only thinner, so thin. In the distance, thunder, though the sky reflected in the water her mother floats in, burns bright blue. Two. Gather these materials, slivers of wet soap, hair swirling pond water, black oil. Amar pita duidena, grandmother says, so mother palms the pink soap, slides it between her small hands before arcing its jasmine-scented froth across her back. Gather these materials, the afternoons, undrowned ceremonies, the nattering of cicadas. Yes, yes, yes. Mother watches grandmother disappear into water, light, many leafed, like bits of bombshells, gleaming like rose petals, upturned in wet grass, like the long red river in red twilight. Three. 1971, the entire world unraveling like thread your mother pulls and pulls away from the hem of her dress. In America, the bodies of men and women march forward in protest, rage candling their voices. In Vietnam, monks light themselves on fire, learning too late how easily the body burns. And soon, the men whose stomachs flinch inward will struggle the curved blades of their bayonets into khaki-clad bodies. But for now, they lean against the cool stone walls of your grandparents' house, eyes closed as your mother watches her mother twirl in the pond, longs to encircle herself in ripples of light, her fingers might arpeggio across green water. She loves the small diamond in her mother's nose, its sunlit surface glittering like curled hot metal she knows falls from the sky, though never before her eyes. Four, why call any of it back? Easy enough to descend with your mother down and down those hard stone steps. How I loved, she says, to watch her. Yes, reach forward to touch the sun-ambered softness of the bright sari grandmother retwines around her body. Yes, your eyes dazzled by the diamond's many-chambered light. It shines so, mother says, though it's not you she's speaking to anymore, as caught as she is in this reeling backward. 1971, and a Bangladeshi woman catches the gaze of a Pakistani soldier through rain-curved palm trees. Her sari is torn from her. She bathed the same way each time, mother says. The torn woman curls into green silence. First, she would fold her sari, then she would dive in. Yes, the earth green with rain, the water green. Then she would wash her face until her nose pin shined. Ahare, how it shined, his eyes green. Then she would ask me to wash her back, the torn woman, now a helix of blood. Then she would rub cream into her beautiful skin, the soldier buttoning himself back into khaki. Yes, call it all back again. Five. Two oceans between you, but still you can see her running a finger along the granite counter in the sun-spilled kitchen, waiting for the tea to boil before she drives past old West Texas oil fields, still bright with bluebells. But tell me, she asks, why couldn't you research the war from here? Gather these materials, these undrowned ceremonies, tea poured into a cup, a woman stepping lightly across green field into a green pond. But don't tell her the country of her birth become, became a vain geography inside you, another body inside your own. Oh, ma, she sobs. Oh, ma, I miss her so. You open the door to step out to the concrete veranda. Look. The moon is an ivory scythe, gut gutting another pond across which the reflection of a young girl's braid ripples. Tell me, you say, about 1971. <coughs> One of the things that um, was really fascinating to me about my time in Bangladesh was about the way it gave me this very different perspective on the intersection of um, history and family um, 
and memory and history and sort of the difference between um, voyeurism and witnessing. I think all of those dichotomies are so tangled up often. Um, and I felt like my time in Bangladesh would have made me you know, see my mother as a small child during the war, for example, rather than just my mother, um, to see my grandmother as, um, you know, a beautiful young woman bathing, um, and to sort of realize that all around them there are these atrocities that are happening that strangely don't necessarily touch kind of the, the intimacy of the moment they're sharing. Um, I'm going to read a few more poems from Seem. Um, this is En Route to Bangladesh, Another Crisis of Faith, at Dubai International Airport and ending with a line by Cesar Vallejo. Because I must walk through the eye-shaped shadows cast by these curved gold leaves thick atop each constructed palm tree, past displays of silk scarves, lit silhouettes of blue-bottled perfume, because I grip, as though for the first time, a paper bag of french fries from McDonald's and lick from each fingertip the fat and salt as I stand alone to the side of this moving walkway, gliding me past dark-eyed men who do not look away when I stare squarely back. Because standing in line to the restroom, I want only to pluck from her black sweater this one shimmering blonde hair clinging fast. Because I must rest the coke cold in my hand beside this toilet seat warmed by her thighs, her thighs, and hers. Here, at the narrow mouth of this long, humid corridor leading to the plain, I take my place among this damp, dark, horde of men and women who look like me because I look like them, because I am ashamed of their bodies that reek so unabashedly of body, because I can, because I am an American, a star of blood on the surface of muscle. Reading Trans Tremor in Bangladesh for my grandmother. In grandmother's house, we are each a room that must remain locked. Inside it, a prayer mat carelessly folded on a low table, as though hands that once pressed down on it are not now below ground. Who has stripped bare the velvet, who has stripped bare the white walls of the black velvet tapestry depicting Kaaba, house of God? I let in the netherworld, something rose from underneath. I sit, wait through my cousin's sobs, and this morning, another sudden loss, a classmate's death, she says. Sordid details flare out like sails of a ship, mother trapped in an asylum, father weeping, his son's warm corpse cradled in his arms, the chicken bone still lodged in his young throat. To whom would this not be in an elegant death, a caught bone like one of our own? We enter the familiar city, cloaked nightly in fog, light bulbs, lanterns, blurred gold, the rumbling traffic on the highways and the silent traffic of ghosts. I reach for my mother's hand like a child. Here hang the years, they sleep with folded wings. Already I want to shed each jagged dirt road, bodies jostled inside each swerving car, trains draped with bodies dangling like writhing vines. The cars, packed tight, do not move. I saw the image of an image of a man coming forward. Sudden as starlight, he lifts an arm, mere bone, wrapped in brown skin, stem of an iris rotting in water. He taps the glass, I close my eyes, and I see the bone of his arm trapped in a young boy's throat. It is still beautiful to hear the heart, but often the shadow seems more real than the body. How thin the seam between the world and the world a few layers of muscle and fat, a sheet wrapped around a corpse, glass so easily ground into sand. Um, the next few poems I'm going to read, um, I'm just going to read a couple more from Seam, from the um, sequence of poems that um, are in the middle of the book that, um, that 
are um, the imaginary conversations um, with the Brongana, the women who were raped during the war. <clears throat> Interview with the Brangana. Would you consider yourself a survivor or a victim? Each week, I pull hard the water from the well, bathe in my sari, wring it out, beat it against the flattest rocks. Are you Muslim or Bengali? They asked again and again. Both. I said, I'm both. Then rocks were broken along my spine, my hair a black fist in their hands, pulled down into the river again and again, each day, each night, river, rock, fist. The river wanders this way, breaks that way. Isn't that always the river's play? Interviewer's note. You listen to the percussion of monsoon season's wet wail. Write in your notebook, Bhalo me, karap me, choto shundori. Bad girl, good girl, little beauty. In Bangla, there are words for every kind of woman, but a raped one. The interviewer acknowledges shame. After she has ducked through the low-slung metal shack, the war-raped woman she's come to visit offer tea, drowsy with sweet. They begin to speak, unlocking the desiccated coffins of their grief, and the video camera's lens blinks on their dawn-thin faces until daylight spools itself back into darkness. Anything, she says, you would like to tell me, anything you can remember, she ducks back under the clothesline, heavy with faded saris, out to the main road, and after the rickshawala pedals across town to a small, heat-spattered hotel room, she wraps a dark silk scarf around herself until twilight and rubs her eyes riverbank raw until she lies on the hard, narrow bed and begins to touch herself. After the familiar arched shuddering, she wishes she could cry because that, at least, might be redemption for each broken body that can't be restored. She doesn't feel shame's dark circle tightening after waking to the mirror, dust-webbed, nor when she boards the bus back to the city. Sunlight fades the open window in Sunlight fades the open windows into white dreams, and a child bends down, elevates a pink blossom away from a green field. It's later, when she arrives back at a borrowed flat, begins to strip off travel pungent clothes, and smells her own body's resinous musk. It's when she sits down naked at the desk to rewind and fast forward through all the pixelated footage of the women's kerosene lives. It's when she begins to write about it in third person, as though it was that simple to unnail myself from my own body. All right. I wanted to just um, take a moment and thank um, Farina and the South Asian um, Center, South Asian, uh, Center for South Asian Studies, <laughs> Center for South Asian Studies for having me um, today. Um, one of the most amazing things about um, the writing of Seam for me um, and then the publication of it has been how it's put me in contact with so many amazing um, South Asian artists um, and thinkers and scholars. Um, I grew up in West Texas, in the suburbs of West Texas, not just West Texas, but in the suburbs of West Texas. And um, I didn't have a lot of, I didn't really have any South Asian friends, to be honest, until I went to Bangladesh. So um, it was particularly amazing for me to be invited to do this because I was just like, you know, I've always kind of been struggling a little bit, like I think, um, a lot of um, second generation immigrants do with sort of like what it means to be, you know, how, 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 how are you supposed to be South Asian in the right way versus the wrong way versus, you know, how you sort of like view yourself in any kind of way as a right or wrong person. And, and um, so it means a lot to me to be here. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming out. Um, um, it means a lot to see um, people who um, I just met and I'm getting to know and um, it, yeah, I feel really welcome here. So thank you. Um, so I think what I'm going to do for the rest of 
um, my time is I'm gonna read some love poems from my second um, manuscript. Um, there's some, it's kind of dark out there these days. Um, and, you know, I think like, I think we could always stand to, to use some more love poems. Um, I'm also um, in love, fortunately, with um, a really amazing um, poet named Jamal May. So um, the book is dedicated to him. Um, and I'm going to read um, just a few poems from it. Um, let's see. This is called Dark Pairing, and it has a line from Sylvia Plath's The Beekeeper's Daughter. I am learning to love you, my fingers unruly, but what thrives without special treatment? Not all species are hardy, easy to grow from seed. Let us remember how innocent we were. Some species prefer full sun, and others tolerate the shade. Love, didn't I know you first by your body's particulate sweat? Some species are overlooked, mistaken for weeds, choked by the neighboring. And there was a time I was one of many thin stalks none would want to cut. You move among the many-breasted hives, my heart under your foot, sister of a stone. It's true that I gave you the memory of my sister to keep, seed of her ghost. And you hear like this, pressing back. It comes back readily, and I turn to you, caught, your mouth opening. I feared my father most and fought his voices hard darkening. Toughest of all species, it does survive on its own. And though the propensity to hybridize creates confusion, you and I continue to bend into and away from each other, dark pairing. I understand now the fear of a child growing into a woman, one who might show love kneeling down to drink again the riotous tangling of my legs in yours. Don't we have to cut away rungs from this wild climbing? Here is grace, such verdant and frostburnt propagating. Um, a um, very dear friend and mentor of mine just passed away a couple of days ago. Um, and she was so supportive of the poems um, when I was a graduate student at VCU. Um, uh, when they were just like little fledgling kind of babies, the, the, the poems, the interview poems that um, I went to Bangladesh to, to work on more. Um, and she was just such an amazing woman. I realized that one of the things that just sort of distinguishes her is that, um, oh, her name is Claudia Emerson, by the way. She's an amazing poet. Um, and one of the things I realized that sort of distinguishes her is that she really loves herself. And I think we often talk about love for each other and you know empathy and compassion for others. But I think um, empathy and compassion for others comes from being able to love yourself, I think. And um, Claudia was just a woman who loved herself, you know, and, and I sort of feel like um, I can't bear to read her poems right now because they seem so precious already that it hurts to read them. But um, I wrote this poem for her um, and sent it to her a few weeks ago um, before she um, ended up dying of cancer the past few, a couple days ago. So I'd like to read this poem for her. It's called um, We Do It Inelegantly. It was a sliver of a sliver of a sliver of a moment that began in the beginning when the first leaf understood it was a planet cradled by wind. You were there, we all were, and we could see, finally, good God, the crust of the salt of our own mutinies. When was the last time you, how long has it been since I, we asked, and rubbed from our eyes the doctrines of our fears. But look how long it takes to melt the plastic bricks barricading us apart. Let's hurry up and laugh them away until we too are vapor and will become the wizards we still are, inshallah, and will summon the asphalt of yellow ribboned highways between us. The lyric you have always said can contain, and so it does, end over end over end. 
In a dream or memory, I married a man on horseback, while behind us burned the accomplishment of editing, factories lit to blazing, spliced into a three-minute segment on last night's news. Time felt so delicate that night, like a just cleaved apple right before its halves fall. I promised him nothing I couldn't take back, but I still disassembled when he left. You said that was okay, that you had to. Yes, we do it inelegantly, we do it at all. Your bright wing and the pen growing from its feathers uncapped, your agreement to never not try. I first learned to stre I first learned the strength to leave from you. How close are we to heaven? Odd slingshots that we are. Um, I'm going to close with um I'm going to close with um a a brand new poem. Um I heard Rick Barrett um, say that a poet should always be in trouble. So um, this is this is me sort of like, this is me being and this is me being a masochist is what it is. So um, thank you very much for um, coming and being here. And I'll read this last poem and maybe take a few questions. Um, thank you. This is called "While It's Still Safe." First, I said yes here by the light. Then I said, the darkness has its own blindfold, the pearls of the eyes of anyone who will leave you. He said, a sprig of sage for your hair. He said, rind of lemon for your fingers. First I said, la ilaha illallah by the light. Then I said, the darkness has its own faith. The question of what will come after the air raid, after the shooting, or after the next shooting, after the morning is blank and the sun shines on this dark river of limbs. First I said, tomorrow. Then I said, I will leave now. I will leave now while it's still safe. A few more minutes, my love, he said, a few more hours. Trust, he said. I said, here is your sprig of sage, here your rind of lemon. And the uniformed man beside him smiled and raised his gun higher. Here is the sound a body makes when it is about to die, I didn't say, and I made no sound. He said, here is the sound a body makes when it returns to where it belongs. And he took his hand in mine. I said, sprig. I said, rind. I said, why, when I watched him die. First, I said, grave. Then, I said, love. And I put my hand in what was left of his. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions, maybe. Yeah, Kirsten. Um, yeah, so I started out writing the poems um, from imagination and sort of um, when I went to Bangladesh, a couple of different things happened. I felt like in a way um, I, I went there to ask them permission to write more poems and almost to ask them if the poems I had already written were okay. Um, so I felt like a lot of the conversations that I ended up having with the women um, felt less to me about um, transcription um, into the poems that ended up being in the book and more about um, trying to um, capture the um, voice of what they were saying, the tenor of what they were saying. Um, and part of that came from sort of just being there physically in front of them and being able to see details like where they live and how they live. Um, and um, I, th I think too the other thing that happened is that it really changed the way I thought about um, kind of this, I guess, distinction between um, survivorhood and victimhood. Um, I interviewed an entire sister, an uh, entire family of sisters. Um, each of them had been raped during the war. Um, and I was speaking with one sister and one, another one came up behind me and she started playing with my hair. Um, now in Bangladesh, 
um, upper class women tend to straighten their hair and um, working class women tend to, you know, comb it and tie it back so that you don't necessarily see a lot of just kind of like random curly hair. So in a strange way, even though I'm as Bangladeshi as far back as I can remember, it was my hair was sort of this thing that strangely distinguished me as a foreigner. And um, so I was speaking to one sister and the other one came up behind me and she started playing with my hair. And she said, you poor thing, you must have no one to comb your hair. And it totally blew me away because I hadn't, of course, um, been sure what to expect in terms of how the conversations were going to change the way I thought about them. But it just drew into relief the fact that, um, you know, again, empathy is this sort of two-way street and so is curiosity. And, you know, so many of our conversations didn't make it into the book, but um, sort of like Joseph Cornell buying so much um, material to sort of make those tiny, perfectly curated little shadow boxes, I felt like I had to go and kind of experience all of this stuff to sort of like compress down into these um, small little narratives. Yeah. Sasha, yeah. thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, the piece about 71, it's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'm struck by, by something today, which is I'm wondering, um, you're using categories and victim that seem, um, you know, very familiar to me from, from an American discourse. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm wondering to what extent are those even categories that mm -hmm. are meaningful right. in I Bangladesh? And, and, yeah. you know, if so, and, and what other categories, I mean, one of the things that your very powerful poem talking about how there isn't a, a Bengali word for raped woman, mm -hmm. and yet there is a Bengali term, and you yourself invoke it. Birangana. Right? right. For yeah. the women raped in the context of the right. war. So I mean, so there's like there's a host of questions yeah. in there. You can engage them in any way that you choose. Yeah, well, you know, to go back actually um, briefly to the idea of collaboration, one of the things I'm really interested in is slipperiness. I suppose, um, between terms, between categories, um, between ideas, between genres. Um, and so I feel like, um, just to speak a little bit to those categories, I think that's one of the things that I was trying to um, achieve with my research there. And um, what ended up becoming seen was kind of my awareness of how problematic it was to try to write between those categories anyway, I think drove a lot of the way I approached it. Um, and so, um, and, and then to sort of speak to um, this notion of the fact that, of course, there's that this term that was used as sort of um, a, a way of a, an attempt to lionize these women. But of course, as so often happens, the term ended up sort of becoming synonymous with the very shame or stigma that it was, um, you know, trying to alleviate or prevent. Um, and and, and yeah, I mean, I feel like that's the thing that's so tricky about teaching history and trying to write into history or away from it. Um, one of the things that um, I, I dealt with in Bangladesh actually was um, a lot of resistance from um, sometimes members of my own family in terms of sort of like a, almost like um, like the Holocaust, like a denial the fa of the fact that that sort of thing had ever occurred. You know, I had a distant uncle. Um, uh, you know, say something to me like, you know, he was just like, well, you know, they're all lying, right? I mean, you know that your project is basically dependent upon a lot of lies, you know, that um, aren't actually true, and this never happened, and those women just want money and whatever, whatever, right? So I feel like, too, part of the complexity is that you're trying to, you know, capture one or maybe, you know, as many possible truths as you can but there's always going to be stuff outside the frame that is that is missed, I think. Does that speak to some of yeah. some of your questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, i've I've tried to teach about nineteen seventy one too, and it's always it's always a a challenge, um, especially, I think, too, because of the way the the state of Bangladesh itself sort of um shifts between it's kind of like, um, you know, sort of like either it's um, anti, Pakistan or anti-India or pro-Pakistan, pro-India, you know, sort of sentiments. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Is 
That's a that's such an interesting question. Um, I have um, I have folks sometimes send me emails sort of with um, I saw this you know news of sexual assault in um, another country. I thought maybe you might want to write about it. And and the truth is is I'm I'm really pretty sure that I'm done with that um, particular project. Um, I feel like for me um, this particular project. And, and any really sort of comes from a place of compulsion and obsession. And I feel like I'm doing sometimes delving deeper into the work of it as a way of exhausting something. Um, and so I feel like while um, I think I'll, I'll always be interested in sort of these, the concepts or ideas um, that are brought up by Seam, I don't think that I'm going to be revisiting this particular subject matter specifically again, probably. Um, Although I am working on a memoir right now, and I think um, I'll be able to sort of like write into some of the things that didn't make it into seem more from a prose perspective, but that seems different, I suppose. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you navigate the use of um, language, um, the music, and then also follow it up? Voice is so so important, but then accessibility is something that is so I'm just wondering. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I I really go back and forth. I think my approach is kind of some combination of deliberate and intuitive. Sometimes I feel like um, I I want the 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 language of Bengali there to um, create a kind of texture musically that may not have anything to do with direct translation. And I, I learned to read the Quran at a very, very young age, um, but I learned to read the Arabic without knowing the meaning. And um, something about that sort of made me understand that language can have meaning without um, being defined, you know? So I felt like... Um, I, I sort of learned that you can, like, be moved by um, by music in a way that is meaningful but separate from definition, if you see what I mean. So I feel like, um, it, you know, it varies from poem to poem depending on um, what what the poem calls for, I guess. Um, but I think it's such an interesting topic because, of course, there's a kind of way of, you know, the Internet being available to everybody sort of strangely democratizes whether or not people can use, um, you know, even like I'm thinking about ekphrastic poems, for example, poems based on paintings or other works of art, um, you know, that balance of what are you, what what sort of um, work of art are you, are you trying to create that will simultaneously maintain the beauty of that mystery that we all sort of go to for art? Um, and that we're sort of also trying to excavate or understand in ourselves while creating a client kind of clarity that allows um, a reader or external participant in to, to have for their own as well. Um, and I think increasingly and in kind of like because of globalization and democratization of all over the country, um, all over the world, I mean, there's a way in which um, I feel like those concerns seem less um, loaded, I guess. Like it seems... It, it seems to me that we're in this particularly exciting time in American poetics because of conversations like this, you know, because of sort of thinking whether or not, um, or, or how we approach these these notions of like clarity versus mystery. Thanks. Yeah. It's a little bit related, but in terms of different media relationship between the oral and the visual, in the text itself, Mm -hmm. arrangement there. Mm -hmm. Well, I was trying to see how much of that came out or didn't come out in your reading. It, they seem quite different. Huh. Uh, and you started out by projecting where we were experiencing several different you know, sensory inputs. Uh, when you decided to present your poet, your the works from Seam and the other poems, you didn't put them up there visually. No, yeah. And I wonder, I mean, just as we're talking about the presence and absence of translation of another language. Mm -hmm. There's two things going on here in the poem, and I just wanted to hear you say a little more about the visual in relationship to uh, both the semantic and the, the oral. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that um, 
you know, poetry has always seemed to me to occupy this really interesting space between prose and song. And um, so I, f I feel like um, I'm interested in the way that poetry is simultaneously a visual and oral medium. Um, and, and I feel like I'm, I'm interested in formal poetry and form because of shapeliness, to kind of speak to the way that they look on the page. Um, I'm, I'm really... I'm really fascinated by form, what it can do as tools, and again, where we can be slippery with them. Like we can take these sort of like, take a sonnet and break it apart, for example, or mess with the rhymes in a villanelle and the different, the different ways we can be deviant, um, sort of deviance um, and create something new. Um, and so for me, shapeliness, the, the visual aspect of form is, is I, I want the poem to, to sort of have a shape that also embodies what the content of the, and the meaning of the poem is. Um, and in terms of reading the poems out loud, I feel like I'm always sort of fascinated by how I read my poems because I read them differently every time and I notice the sort of sonic, what's going on sonically differently every time I read them. And um, I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, hopefully this doesn't sound um, ridiculous, but I really love my own poems, <laughs> like, and, and not because um, I'm an egotistical person, but because the writing of my own poems moves me, you know, because like I feel like I learn from them and I feel like I become a better person because I write them. And so I always feel like my poems are sort of weird, precognitive creatures that sort of know a lot more than I do. Um, so I feel like um, I'd never really thought particularly about um, until you asked about, you know, the, the way they, you know, the way they um, are, are read out loud in terms of like the way they sound, you know? Um, so I feel like I'm always kind of discovering these different sonic textures in my own poems. And part of that is because I care very much about the shape of sounds as well as the shape of um, the way it looks on the page. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I read, I read this short story by Cynthia Oza, Jewish author, mm -hmm. and she wrote about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. and I struggle with that constantly um, because on one hand I think that um, I feel like poetry all works of art are, are arguments you know like they're they're trying to make an argument using a particular kind of template or a particular kind of vocabulary and um, and I feel like, um, actually, when Seam, when it was announced that Seam um, had won the Crab Orchard Award in Poetry, I felt really sick to my stomach um, because I felt a little bit of that deep shame that you're talking about. Uh, because I know I wrote a problematic book that um, doesn't take away what happened to these women, doesn't fully describe what happened to them, doesn't necessarily made them feel any more seen or understood, doesn't necessarily, you know, like um, even, you know, give them any financial comfort, you know. And I struggle with that often in terms of how to, um, you know, how to, how to view the responsibility I feel as both a person as, and as an artist, you know. Um, and, I, and I think, like, increasingly I sort of feel like the world is the world is such a troubled, troubling place in so many ways, and I'm sort of willing to accept any attempt at failure, you know, any attempt to try to get at um, creating anything that might help us become more um, aware, self-aware, noticing, attentive, compassionate people. Um, so I feel like as troubled as I often I am by um, by the way that the worries I feel sometimes about exploitation of the material or um, getting it wrong, you know, having gotten it all wrong, for example, um, all of those things certainly come up for me, but I feel like it's sort of like this kind of two steps forward, one step backwards sort of situation where I feel sort of like simultaneously like, you know, like so moved by the fact that so many more people because of seem know that this happened to a lot of the women while simultaneously feeling very troubled that um, you know when we when we write work that tries to witness or document we're always failing at it somehow any other questions
Well, thank you so much. Thank you.